All right, great. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We have Walker Ray from the LSE presenting his paper, A Preferred Habit Model of Term Premia and Currency Risk, joint with Pierre-Olivier Gorinchev from Berkeley and Dimitri Vallano is also from the LSE. Uh, so per usual, we will be uh, having a mostly uninterrupted presentation for the first 15 minutes, but if you have questions or clarifying questions, please send them to us by the chat and we'll interrupt uh, Walker periodically to have him address those. And then we'll have a longer, about 25 minute discussion after the presentation. So thank you again for being here and Walker, the floor is yours. Great, so thanks so much. Thanks for the organizers for putting together this uh, really awesome online seminar series in these days. Uh, and very, very happy to be invited to present this paper. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and feedback. So the starting point for this project is just the, 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 the observation that it's very difficult to reconcile movements in exchange rates with macroeconomic fundamentals or to link movements in exchange rates with other asset prices. Of course, this fact has been documented repeatedly uh, in, in the literature. For instance, uncovered interest rate parity, which theoretically um, ties together expected movements in the exchange rate with short rate interest differential, short interest rate differentials is strongly rejected in the data. Um, at the same time, the expectations hypothesis, which theoretically links uh, future movements in the short rate to long term yields also finds very little empirical support. Um, and again, there's a large literature documenting these deviations. Um, a more recent but growing literature is, has also now demonstrated that currency risk premia and uh, so excess returns in currency markets and excess returns in bond markets are also quite deeply connected together. Um, and then the final motivating fact for this paper, which is a little bit separate, is, has been the observed response to the Federal Reserve's quantitative easing programs. So QE has not only pushed uh, long-term treasury yields down, it also seems to have had strong effects on the US exchange rate and even had effects in foreign yield curves as well. And this all took place at a time in which the US Fed policy rate was pinned down at the zero lower bound and other countries' policy rates were, all, were likewise pinned down at the zero lower bound. Um, so this again is hinting at this strong linkages between currency risk premia and term premia. Uh, moreover, QE seems to be pointing to this fact that quantities matter. The quantities matter a lot for determining how risk premia are determined. Um, so we think this is important, not only to understand the determinants of exchange rates, generally speaking, um, but from a more macro perspective, this is important because it's key to understanding the transmission mechanisms of monetary policy, whether we're thinking conventional monetary policy or unconventional policy like large scale asset purchases. So what we're going to be interested in is studying how monetary policy transmits both domestically along a given country's yield curve, as well as internationally through either exchange rates and spilling over into foreign yield curves. Um, but on the, theor on the theoretical side, when thinking about transmission of monetary policy, a lot of our understanding is based on our more standard representative agent uh, macro models. And of course, these models are going to have a hard time delivering deviations from UIP or the expectations hypothesis. So what we do in this project is instead build on the more recent literature, uh, which emphasizes the central role that the constraints that are faced by financial intermediaries play in explaining these deviations um, from risk neutral pricing. Um, so in particular, what we do in this paper is introduce what we call a risk averse global rate arbitrager. Uh, and this arbitrager, the set of arbitragers, uh, invest in global bond markets as well as in FX markets. Uh, and the idea we have here is that the marginal investor in these markets and these global markets is much more likely to be a specialized trader or investor like a macro hedge fund rather than a representative household uh, who's trying to smooth out consumption risk. Um, so formally what we're gonna do is extend the Vianos and Vila preferred habitat type of model to a two country setting. Um, and so what this is going to allow us to do is develop an integrated framework to study the joint determinants of bond premia and term premia. So to quickly preview some of the main findings of our, of our model. Uh, first, uh, our model is able to reproduce um, all, the, all the key documented facts relate about bond premia and currency premia. That is, our model delivers deviations from UIP, deviations from the expectations hypothesis, and it's able to 
uh, to match the demonstrated linkages between the two risk premia that has been found in the literature. Uh, next, what the model is going to show is that uh, international spillovers, spillovers for monetary policy uh, are also going to be quite important. Um, this is particularly true uh, for unconventional policy, large, like large-scale asset purchases. So our model is going to be able to help rationalize the observed response we've seen to, say, the QE program. And then from a more open economy macro perspective, one of the main policy takeaways here is that floating exchange rates only provide so much insulation uh, to the domestic economy. So what I mean by that is that uh, policy shock shocks abroad, we're going to show we're going to have quite big spillovers into the domestic yield curve. Essentially what's happening is policy shocks, whether they're conventional or unconventional, are going to lead to fluctuations in, in risk premia, term premia as well as currency risk premia, and through the allocation decisions of our global arbitragers are then going to spill into the domestic yield curve. So what this means is that despite the fact that uh, the model features freely flowing capital, despite the fact that uh, exchange rates are fleet, uh, floating freely, we're still not going to be able to necessarily achieve full monetary policy autonomy. Um, and then so before diving in, let me just say that we kind of view this model as a step as the first step in a broader kind of research agenda. Um, and we do think that there's uh, a lot more that we can do with this, that answering a lot more ambitious questions that we haven't quite got to yet. Uh, but let me just highlight some of what we think that what we're continuing to work on. Uh, so first, uh, we're working on taking this, the model that we have of bond markets and currency markets and embedding it in a more standard type of open economy macro model, moving towards more general equilibrium type of uh, questions like I've done in previous work in a more closed economy setting. Um, and then the second thing which I want to highlight and make clear is that today I really will be talking about deviations in UIP. We'll have nothing to say about deviations in covered interest rate parity, uh, but I think this is uh, a very important extension for future work. Um, so with that motivation, let me jump into the model. Um, I guess I will, if there's any clarifying questions before I jump in, I can pause for a second. Um, I can't see the chat, if, but if there's any questions that, uh, that have come up so far. There's no questions at, at this point. I think we're, uh, you're good to jump into the uh, description of the model. Okay, great. So let's just dive right in. Um, so the model is going to be a two-country continuous time model. The countries are going to be home and foreign. Um, and so first, let me lay out the assets that we're going to be interested in pricing in this model. First is going to be the nominal exchange rate, which we denote by ET. And this is going to be the home price of the foreign currency. So we're taking uh, the convention that an increase in ET, you interpret, should interpret this as a depreciation of the home currency. On top of foreign currency, there's also going to be a continuum of bonds um, in each country where maturity is going to be denoted by tau. And so we also will be interested in determining the price of long-term bonds in both countries, P of tau, and where the yield and prices are related in the usual way. Um, then the final uh, uh, price that we're gonna be interested in here is the final interest rate we're gonna be interested in is the nominal short rates, which for now we're gonna be taking as exogenous and they're gonna follow these, uh, these mean reverting stochastic processes. So we're going to interpret these exogenous uh, processes for short rates as a simple way of capturing fluctuations in conventional monetary policy that the central bank uh, undertakes through control of the short rate. Um, but endogenizing this, this uh, the monetary policy is an important next step, as I was mentioning, uh, when we move towards more full scale general equilibrium type of models. Um, but for now, we just are thinking of monetary policy as essentially represented by this stochastic type of process for the short term nominal interest rate. So those are the assets that we want to price in this model, exchange, foreign currency, which is the exchange rate, and then um, bond prices in both the home and foreign country. So who are the, now what are the players that we're going to set up here? We're going to have three main type of investors. Um, first are going to be the home and the foreign preferred habitat bond investors. So these investors are going to have idiosyncratic preferences uh, for bonds of a specific maturity and in a specific currency. And what we're trying to capture here is the idea that, say, a US-based pension fund is going to have strong preferences for holding uh, long-term bonds and particular long-term treasuries because they're denoted in, uh, denominated in US dollars. Um, and you know, uh, one of the reasons we might think this is because often pension funds have long-term liabilities that are denominated in dollars, and so they want to match uh, their, their liabilities with the, with the bonds that they hold. Analogously, we are also gonna uh, introduce preferred habitat currency traders 
And these traders are going to specialize in just holding foreign currency. Um, again, we think of this as a, as a uh, simple way of capturing um, the demand for currency that rises as the, for the net behavior of exporters and importers in the two different countries. Um, so the existence of these, prefer these preferred habitat investors in bond markets and currency markets uh, introduces a degree of segmentation into the model. And in fact, if we only had these investors, the model would exhibit extreme segmentation. Uh, but the final set of investors are these global rate arbitragers. Our global rate arbitragers are able to allocate their portfolio across both bond markets and into foreign currency markets. And they're going to provide at least a degree of integration across all of these, uh, about, across all of these markets. So let me talk a little bit about what the arbitragers are doing first. They have wealth denoted by W, which they uh, are going to choose to allocate into um, the, the, all the assets that I just talked about. Um, they're going to do so in order to satisfy a mean variance trade-off in the change in their wealth, where this parameter A governs the trade-off that they face between the expected change in their wealth and the risk associated with that. So you can think of A as an actual literal risk aversion parameter, or you can think of it as a proxy for capturing um, all of the types of uh, features that lead to these arbitragers having limited risk-bearing capacity. And so examining their budget constraint is useful to think about the decisions that, that they'll be making. So they can always invest all of their wealth in the home short-term interest rate, which is RHT. And from their perspective, this is the riskless asset. They're, they're going to be offering a, a riskless return. But so relative to that case, they can additionally invest and get more return by investing in foreign currency, which is the second term in their budget constraint. They can in, uh, invest in long-term bonds in the home country, which is this third term. So they can invest in all of the bonds uh, going from zero up until some uh, capital T. And then finally, they can invest in long-term bonds in the foreign country as well. And keep in mind, whenever they invest in either uh, foreign currency or in foreign long-term bonds, they first uh, convert that investment into the foreign currency and then convert it back into the home currency. So this is where we see these uh, changes in the exchange rate showing up. Um, but the key here is that uh, in order, so besides, so the home short rate is the riskless asset to the arbitragers. All these other investment opportunities are, are risky. And so, of course, to be induced to take positions in these risky assets, they're going to be required to be compensated for taking on that additional risk with higher expected returns. Now, turning to the preferred habitat investors, we're going to take um, a bit of a stylized approach to the demand for, that comes from these investors. First, talking about the bond habitat investors. Habitat uh, investors that have maturity tau in a given country J are going to face the following uh, demand curve. It's going to be downward sloping in terms of the price of the bond, where the, where the strength of this uh, or the slope of this demand curve is governed by this alpha parameter, essentially the elasticity of their demand. Um, and then this beta term is going to represent time varying shifts in their demand that might occur. The theta function governs where in maturity space and how large those demand shocks are. Um, so again, what we're trying to capture here is the idea that investors like pension funds might have specific preferences for long-term bonds. Um, and moreover, they are elastic uh, investors. So in other words, when bond prices fall, or in other words, in, the, in their preferred maturity, in other words, when the yields go up, they, they prefer all else equal to hold more of those bonds. Analogously, we have uh, demand coming from the foreign currency habitat traders. They also are going to face downward sloping demand curves in terms of the price of foreign currency, so in terms of the nominal exchange rate, where the slope of their demand curve is governed by this alpha elasticity term. Uh, and then gamma here, analogously to beta in the bond habitat investors, gamma is gonna govern uh, the time varying uh, uh, shocks to their demand as well. Walker, can I ask yes. a clarifying question on this slide? So, yes. so uh, these demand curves that you're uh, tracing out, they're, they're sort of, um, they depend on the right-hand side on, on all, all of these are nominal variables. Is that correct? Yeah. So, yes. Oh, okay. So, so could you talk a little bit about that and how inflation figures into this? And yeah, so we today, we're, we do everything here in nominal terms. So we're really abstracting away from inflation. Um, uh, so generally speaking, like uh, when I've worked on this in a more closed economy setting, when you move to a more general equilibrium model and add in inflation, um, Inflation doesn't really change the, the story too much here, um, but, it, but it's, yeah, I mean, you can rewrite all these things in terms of real returns or real prices if you'd like. 
uh, the story is quite similar. Um, of course, it introduces an additional source of risk potentially. Um, so here we're really abstracting away from that. Um, but yeah, with everything here, we're taking just in nominal terms in the in the. Okay. Uh, quick sorry. quick follow up from uh, from Oleg. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Didn't mean to do that. Um, he he's asking why does um, the demand for currency depend on the level or the log of the nominal exchange rate and not on the expected rate of depreciation or appreciation? Yes. Yeah, so that's we. Um, in the, in the same way that we, so arbitragers, of course, care about the expected appreciation or depreciation and the risk associated with that uh, because they're choosing their portfolio allocation to optimize their preferences. Um, these habitat investors have more idiosyncratic demand. So in the same way that we think sometimes these type of investors might be, say, like yield chasing, we think analogously this is what we're trying to capture here um, in terms of uh, the habitat demand that comes from foreign currency. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the key insight here is that, and maybe as I've been hinting a little bit about uh, in this discussion is that, so in one sense, these habitat investors, you can kind of think of them as like noise traders. They're adding additional, uh, they have somewhat pre idiosyncratic preferences for these assets, but it also is important to keep in mind that they're price elastic uh, in the way that I just described. So in other words, when prices move endogenously, these habitat investors are gonna uh, either increase or decrease their holdings of long-term bonds and currency. Um, so, in other words, price movements in equilibrium are going to be leading to these habitat investors uh, to endogenously change their, their portfolio allocations. And this is going to matter because, of course, in equilibrium, we need uh, the stock of all these assets to clear. Um, in particular, all of the bonds in both countries and the foreign currency needs to either be held by the habitat investors or by the global arbitrageurs. So, equilibrium here is going to be obtained. Um, prices are going to be adjusting both to satisfy the downwards the demand to such that the habitat investors are on their demand curves, but also such that the uh, arbitragers are satisfying their optimality conditions and at the same time is taking the opposite positions um, as, as the habitat investors such that markets clear. So now let me just talk a little bit about the intuition behind uh, what this, what this, uh, how this model achieves equilibrium and the lessons from the model. So I'm gonna start with a natural benchmark uh, the case of a totally, uh, perfectly risk-neutral global rate arbitrage. So that's going to occur in our model when this risk aversion parameter, this proxy for risk-bearing capacity, A, is set to zero. Um, so this, as unsurprisingly, we're going to, in this case, uh, recover all of the predictions of the standard type of model. In particular, the expectations hypothesis is going to hold. Um, the uncovered interest rate parity relationship is going to hold as well. And we're going to see that there's going to be no effect of QE either on the domestic yield curve, the foreign yield curve, or on the exchange rate. Um, and then also we're going to have that the yield curve is completely independent in one country from monetary policy shocks in the other country. So this is a very probably unsurprising result. Um, if arbitragers are perfectly risk neutral, the only thing they care about is expected returns. And if expected returns are equalized across um, all of the assets in the, in the model, then they're indifferent between their allocations. And so the demand that comes from those habitat investors doesn't matter at all. Um, that also, because the expectations hypothesis holds here, we have that say the home long-term uh, bond prices and yields are totally pinned down by the home short rate and analogously for the foreign yield curve. Um, so what we also get here is this classic Mundelian type of insulation. We have that uh, shocks to the short rate in one country uh, don't pass through at all to the yield curve in the other country and fully instead are fully absorbed, so to speak, into the exchange rate. So in trilemma terms, because we have free-flowing capital and floating exchange rates, we get this, uh, this uh, full independence of monetary policy. Monetary policy in one country has a control over the yield curve in, in that given country. Um, now as an intermediate step, uh, let's consider, consider the case of what we call segmented arbitrage. Um, and for now, I'm going to abstract away from uh, stochastic fluctuations in demand that come from the habitat investors. So what we mean by segmented arbitrage here is that we have three sets of arbitragers rather than the one set of uh, what we call global rate arbitragers. So our arbitragers we have here are going to be specialized home bond arbitragers who, only, who are going to allocate uh, their, their wealth into home bonds only, foreign bond arbitragers, and then FX arbitragers who specialize in the currency market. So essentially, you can think of this as two kind of Vianos and Vila models in home and foreign glued together by a, let's say, like a very simplified Gebex majority type of model of the, of the currency markets. 
Um, and this, so this is a useful intermediate step before moving to the global rate arbitrages because some of the main results of the more general model are going to hold here, but also it'll be interesting to see what it is that is gained when we move to the case of global arbitrage. Um, so this version of the model is going to share some features with the risk neutral baseline. In particular, uh, prices of uh, bonds in a given country are, are only a function of the short rate in that country and the exchange rate depends on both of the foreign and the home short rate. Uh, but there also are important differences here as well. Um, so in, in the segmented arbitrage case, we have a couple of new results here that differ from, the, uh, from risk neutrality. First we have, and let's focus here on uh, currency markets. We have this, first we have this attenuation result. That is the exchange rate responds less to shifts in, monetary, in short rates uh, relative to the risk neutral baseline. Uh, and second, the expected return on the currency carry trade is gonna be decreasing in the home short rate, increasing in the foreign short rate, which is implying a UIP deviation. So in our terminology, the currency carry trade involves borrowing at the home short rate, uh, converting that to foreign currency, investing that in the foreign short rate and unwinding that back into the home currency. So the intuition for this result Let's imagine that the foreign short rate is high. Um, then even the logic of the risk neutral type of model would imply that the demand from, our, from uh, currency arbitragers for the currency carry trade starts to increase. That's gonna put upward pressure on foreign currency and so the foreign currency appreciates. But remember that we have these price elastic habitat uh, currency traders. Um, and so as the foreign currency gets more expensive, these habitat investors who have downward sloping demand curves are going to reduce their holdings of foreign currency. Foreign currency is now becoming less appealing to these habitat investors to hold. Um, and so in equilibrium, the arbitragers need to take the opposite position of the habitat, of the, of the FX habitat traders. So the FX arbitragers, all else equal, are forced to increase their holdings of foreign currency by more. This increases their exposure to risk, and so they have to be compensated for this additional source of risk. Um, they're compensated for this by demanding a higher expected currency carry trade return. And so what that delivers is that their currency carry trade return is increasing in the foreign short rate and analogously will be decreasing in the home short rate, implying a deviation from UIP. It's a very similar um, type of... Uh, Walker, could I, could I interrupt you for one second on the currency? Um, yeah. I have a question myself and then I wanted to pass on a question from Oleg uh, from the chat. Uh, the one I have from, uh, that comes from me is, uh, has to do with the underreaction and the dynamics of this. And perhaps you can also feel free to postpone it. Um, but for example, the evidence coming from uh, Rosen Voucher or from um, um, Charles Engel is that there is underreaction in the short run, then the carry trade keeps going and then there's a long run getting back to UAP. Um, now, when Xavier and I wrote our model, because most of it is a two-period model, there wasn't much that we could do about this. We had some ideas of how to do it dynamically, but your model is fully dynamic. And so you have more of an ability to speak to how does the carry trade change over time? Where do you get under and over reaction? Have you guys explored that and do you have a way to think about it? Um, yes, yeah, so let, me, let me, I'll just quickly say that uh, in this version of the model where we only have two just mean reverting short rates, we're not gonna be able to deliver those kind of complicated dynamics. Um, but at the end of the talk, I will maybe, I won't talk exactly about that, but we'll, once the model allows for more complicated dynamics between short rates as well as demand factors, we can uh, replicate some of those, uh, those more complicated dynamics that we see. Perfect. I but mean, it'll be very it, nice. That, but it is, it is, in this simple version of the model, it's not going to, it's not going to come about. Sure, I know. You definitely need more ingredients, but it'll be nice to see what it is, how the model would even rationalize those empirical patterns. I think it's sure. an interesting thing. Let's, let's, then, say that, let's save this and just maybe discuss it a little more at the end. Of course. Let me pass on the question from Oleg. I think Oleg is still wondering about uh, the dependence on just the current exchange rate rather than the future exchange rate or the difference. Yeah. Uh, and in particular, just thinking, well, and I, I can't quite come up with a model where you would depend on the level of ET unless there is something like mean reversion. So I want to buy when it's high and sell when it's low. Uh, can, can you tell us a little bit like um, at a meta level uh, why you think it should depend on the level? Um, well, one, which is not a satisfying answer, but one is for tractability and mirroring the demand that we have for, uh, for that comes from the bond habitat investors. Um, I know that's not super satisfying, but this, uh, generally speaking, when we have the habitat demand 
just depending on log prices, delivers a, allows us to solve the model and delivers a fine term structure and a fine prices in, of, in all, every price is fine in the state variables. Um, if you deviate from this type of pricing, I mean, these types of demand curves, you're gonna, become, you're gonna end up with much, potentially much more complicated uh, solutions to the model. Um, uh, but that's, the, that's just purely in terms of uh, tractability of the model. Um, yeah, I suppose the, it's just to, I think it's just to try to mirror what we think is going on in these kind of less sophisticated investors in bond markets, um, analogously having a set of investors that act that way in, um, in currency markets. Okay, let me um, continue here. Uh, so moving on from the results here in the segmented arbitrage model regarding uh, currency carry trades, we can now say a lot of similar, get, derive some similar results for bond markets. Um, once again, we're gonna get this type of attenuation result. So in other words, bond yields are gonna respond to short rate fluctuations by less than they would in a risk neutral benchmark. Um, as I mentioned before, mimicking the, what we found in the, um, in the risk neutral baseline, bond prices in a given country only respond to the short rates of that given country. Um, and then looking at the bond carry trade, the expected return of the bond carry trade is decreasing in, in, the, uh, in the short rate uh, of that given country, implying a deviation from the expectations hypothesis. And so in our terminology, the bond carry trade here involves borrowing at the short rate of a given country and investing uh, in long-term bonds and then, and, then, and then unwinding that investment. So the intuition here, which is similar to the one, this one single country version of the model in Vianos and Vila, if the short rate in the given country is low, then all else equal investor arbitragers want to invest more in the bond carry trade as, you know, as this type of uh, channel is present even under risk neutrality. That's going to put upward pressure on bond prices. But again, when bond prices go up, the habitat investors uh, for long-term bonds, who again are price elastic, find those bonds to become uh, less, prep, uh, they find them less desirable, and so they reduce their holdings of long-term bonds. When they do that, on the other side of the market, again, that implies that the bond arbitragers, all else equal, need to increase their holdings of long-term bonds. Again, this is exposing them to risk, and so to be compensated for that exposure, they require a larger uh, expected return of the bond carry trade. Um, and so what that delivers is that the expected return of the bond carry trade um, is going in the opposite direction of the short rate in that, in, in that given country, implying a deviation from the expectations hypothesis. Um, so now, even though I've uh, abstracted away from uh, time varying uh, stochastic demand shocks, we can still use the, the, this version of the model uh, to talk about, let's say, one-off uh, zero probability type of events. Um, and so what we're going to be able to do is look at what the model says about a QE type of a shock, which we model as a fully unexpected increase in bond, in bond demand in a given country. Um, and what this segment, what this model is going to imply is that QE in country J reduces yields in that country, uh, but has no effect on bond yields in the other country or on the exchange rate. So the logic here is kind of the reverse of what I was just talking about. So when the central bank buys a lot of long-term bonds, they're buying them, they're removing them off of the balance sheet of these bond arbitragers. And so they're removing uh, exposure that, they, that those arbitragers uh, have to risk. And so they require less compensation to hold uh, bonds and that puts uh, downward pressure on yields. Um, but because of the segmentation that we have in the model, there's no spillover effects of this type of policy uh, into either the exchange rate or the other country. So what this seems to imply is that like the risk neutral baseline, we have this strong insulation result uh, monetary policy abroad does not spill over to, uh, to the yield curve domestically. Um, and this insulation is actually even stronger in the case of QE, the exchange rate is even unchanged. Um, but this is for very different reasons than the risk neutral baseline. To put it kind of in trilemma terms, this is fully uh, a feature of the market segmentation that we've imposed here. Essentially, you can think of this as like limiting capital flows and not because of floating exchange rate. What we'll see is that when we move to the case of global arbitrage, this result is not necessarily going to hold in. So now we're moving to, again, abstracting away from demand shocks, but now we are moving to the more general case, which is one set of arbitragers, these global rate arbitragers, who simultaneously invest 
in uh, bonds in the home country, bonds in the foreign country, and foreign currency markets. So we're going to get some of the same results uh, that we had in the segmented case. We're going to still recover the fact that the currency carry trade and the home bond carry trade uh, expected returns are decreasing in the home short rate. And we're also going to get this attenuation type of result. In fact, it's even going to be stronger than in the case of segmented markets. Um, but unlike the case, either the risk neutral be benchmark or in the case of segmented arbitrage, we're also going to get that yields in a given country are going to respond to monetary policy in the other country. And so in particular, looking at say the, the foreign bond carry trade, the expected return on that trade is going to be increasing uh, with the home short rate. So the intuition here for these cross linkages is the following. So again, let's start with say that the home short rate is low. Arbitragers want to invest more both in the home bond carry trade, like the intuition I laid out before, and in the currency carry trade. Um, the same type of uh, channel and mechanism is here. That's going to put uh, upward pressure on the price of the foreign currency. So the foreign currency is going to appreciate. And through the endogenous response of the habitat currency traders is going to apply that uh, that the arbitragers, the global arbitragers, are going to have to hold more foreign currency, which is going to imply that they uh, are increased to more FX risk. The FS, FX risk in particular that they are exposed to is the risk that the foreign short rate is going to fall. So they want to hedge this risk. Oh. Walker, yep. Can I um, uh, interrupt you briefly here? So um, one, one sort of key feature of carry trades, currency carry trades, is that high interest rate currencies uh, co-move and low interest rate currencies co-move. So mm -hmm. it's not just a time series failure of UIP. There's also sort of the interesting cross-sectional patterns, right? Um, but so, but this model can't really speak to that, I guess, because you, you just have the two countries. But if, in, in, if you had a multi-country uh, version of this, would, would you get that sort of co-movement naturally? Yeah. So it would, uh, when I get to the more numerical version of the model, it's still gonna be a two country version. So we're not gonna be able to contrast correlated and uncorrelated countries, but we will be able to allow, say the short rates to be correlated in kind of arbitrary ways. Um, in which case, of course, arbitrages will take that into account and potentially will hedge differently. But here, yes, this relies, these, this intuition here relies on the independence of these two short rates. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, but so just to finish this, so they're going to hedge this um, by uh, basically, so again, they're exposed now to risk that the foreign short rate falls. And so they want to hedge this by investing in assets uh, that, that, rate, that will increase in value when this occurs. And so in particular, the foreign bond carry trade is a particularly appealing uh, uh, trade to make. And so that's going to put downward pressure on foreign yields and the expected uh, return on the bond carry trade in the foreign country decreases as well. So again, in the case of global arbitrage, and unlike either with perfect risk neutrality or even with the segmented version of the model, we have that the bond carry trade in the foreign country is increasing with the home, with the home short rate and vice versa for, uh, across, for cross countries. Um, and then just again, I, even though I've abstracted away from stochastic demand shocks, we can think about a zero probability QE type of shock. Like the segmented arbitrage model, QE is gonna reduce the yields in the country under, in which it's undertaken, but it's also going to reduce yields in the other country and depreciate that country's currency. Again, the logic for QE is, is essentially the mirror image of what I was just talking about with the, with the carry trades, because QE does the opposite. QE goes in and removes risk that these arbitrages are exposed to. Um, so because, say, home, say, the US does QE, that removes the exposure. Uh, bond, the arbitrages hold less long-term treasuries, they're less exposed to risk. In particular, they're less exposed to the risk that say the home uh, policy rate increases. Um, and so now assets that have similar risk characteristics become more appealing. And so in particular, that's gonna, as I described, end up putting downward pressure on yields in the other country. And as well, it's going to lead to a depreciation of, of the dollar in this case. So now, uh, unlike the other two versions of the model, we have the changes in say the home monetary conditions, whether it's conventional or QE, are going to affect yield curves in the other country and the exchange rate. So we have spillovers from monetary policy from one country to the other. So despite the fact that capital flows freely, despite the fact that we have floating exchange rates, we get spillovers from one country to the other. Uh, and again, the reason is that policy shocks abroad, say, um, 
lead to changes in term premia and currency risk premia. Those are transmitted through the reallocation decisions of the global rate arbitragers to bond prices domestically. And so what we get is that no longer is it the case that with floating exchange rates and with fully uh, mobile capital, we still, we now get the, we no longer have full autonomous monetary policy uh, domestically. And so in some ways, this kind of represents a failure of the classic trilemma here. Okay, Walker, okay. could you go back one? And I have a question from Javier Bianchi, um, and he, he would like you to clarify the failure of the trilemma in the following sense. So his question is, if you're allowing, if you're willing to allow changes in the exchange rate, why is the government then unable to set uh, nominal rates independently? Like so, you they, like. right. so they're able to, they still can set the short rate independently. So the short rate is not pinned down at all. But what this means is that um, the, the spillovers, spillovers, the foreign, the freely flowing capital and movements in the exchange rate do not insulate the rest of the yield curve from policy shocks abroad. Okay. Again, Walter, again, I have, um, I have a related question. Um, yeah. You're not changing the exogenous process for the short rate when you change the structure of the markets. Correct. So I, I, I guess another way to phrase uh, Javier's question, and he can jump in on the chat if I'm, if I'm not phrasing it correctly, is you, you could think that the monetary policy reacts to the environment. Monetary policy has a final objective that it wants to achieve, and it's gonna choose a different short-term rate pattern depending on the structure of the world it faces. And here, th that's not quite what's happening. Monetary policy is not trying to achieve an objective. It's trying to say, I'm going to follow this short rate and accept whatever consequences. And I think that that's causing a little bit of the confusion on how you map this into the dilemma. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a totally fair point. I mean, again, we're, we're really just doing kind of a pure financial model of bond markets and, and currency markets here um, to really dive into these questions and talk about monetary policy as we really think about monetary policy. Of course, that has to, we have to take the next step and plunge this into a more general equilibrium type of framework. Um, so yeah, so here, monetary policy, our interpretation of monetary policy, it's quite a simplified version of monetary policy. Um, but it still remains the case that the yield curve is now no longer insulated from shocks abroad, uh, just with floating exchange rates and with, uh, and with freely flowing capital. So that, in that sense, that's what I mean by a failure of this classical trilemma here. OK. Um, so let me now, in the last you know, 10 minutes or so, um, move and just discuss a little bit about, about what else we can do with this model, what we call kind of the full model, where we allow for both demand shocks, stochastic demand shocks arising from the habitat investors, and as I was mentioning, also allowing for a more complicated uh, covariant structure of all these risk factors. So in general, the model we have set up here, um, you just, we've I've collected here all the risk factors, the home and foreign short rate, the demand, uh, bond demand factors and the currency demand factor. Um, and essentially they are allowed to follow this uh, stochastic process with essentially no restrictions on the dynamics matrix here or the, or the correlation structure. Um, despite this, we still get this affine structure of prices as a function of the state variables, um, but it does lead to much more complicated behavior, uh, hedging behavior on the part of arbitrage. So just to, to, to clarify what I mean, so imagine an arbitrager who's taking a long position uh, in home bonds. Again, they're exposed to risk of the fluctuation of the home short rate, but now they're also exposed to the risk that say habitat demand for long-term bonds falls. Um, so they have to simultaneously hedge these sources of risk. And um, to make it even worse, those risk factors might be responding to one another or be correlated. Um, and so because of this additional richness, but complexity of the model, uh, we have to solve the model uh, numerically. Um, and so we conduct this calibration exercise where we uh, calibrate the model using uh, data from the US as the home country and the UK as the foreign country. We target a, lot, uh, a large number of the second moments in the data, looking at either yield curve data or exchange rate data. Um, and so that I don't want to talk too much about this. It's kind of a busy slide, I know, but I want to just highlight a few key estimates here. First, we get that the elasticities of the bond habitat uh, investors in the US are bigger than the UK, and that the size of the demand shocks as measured by this theta function in the US are also bigger than the UK. So this is an, uh, somewhat indirectly the way that the data is telling us, is reflecting that the US treasury market is just quite a bit bigger and, more, and much deeper than the UK gilt market. Um, and then speaking about the correlation amongst these demand factors, 
The data strongly favors allowing these demand uh, factors to respond to these short rates. Um, and of course, also for the short rates to be correlated. Um, so especially this uh, response of demand factors to short rates is mimicking some of the empirical work that Tom Kim um, has done recently when looking uh, in a closed uh, economy setting in the US. Um, so briefly, just the model, uh, unlike the simplified version of the model I was discussing earlier, the model not only does a good job qualitatively of describing of matching moments, but it also quantitatively can miss, uh, match you know, the term structure of uh, variances and covariances across both yield curves. Um, and I think uh, if we have time, maybe in the QA, I can talk, uh, Q and A, I can talk more about this, but I think in the interest of time, um, I will uh, just, just highlight a few things here. Um, so we also, additionally, to, to, to understand what's new about the, uh, the more the fully fledged numerical version of the model and also kind of to assess its uh, untargeted fit, we look at what the model implies um, when looking at the various regressions that people have run in the literature to look at return predictability, either in bond markets as it reflect uh, as a function of the slope of the term structure, as in like Fama and Bliss or Campbell and Schiller, our seminal papers, um, of course, looking at the classic UIP type of regressions that have been run. Um, and then the more recent work that's looked at the, the cross linkages between bond uh, excess returns and currency excess returns. Um, and so both quantitatively, so these are the model implied uh, regression coefficients from Fama and Bliss, uh, as well as Campbell and Schiller. Um, the, in the data, it's typically found that these regression coefficients are greater than zero, which is what would be implied for Fama and Bliss under the expectations hypothesis, and increasing in maturity and quite, and quite large. Um, and so just to, to quickly ex explain what this is saying, it's the model is here delivering this positive relationship between bond excess uh, returns and, and the slope of the term structure in a given country. Um, and then the model can also duplicate, uh, replicate the findings um, when looking at various versions of the UIP trade, essentially what we find here is that the currency trade is profitable, but this profitability does go to zero um, if either the currency carry trade is done with long-term bonds, as in Lustig and Veldoan, or if it's done over a longer-term horizon, as in, uh, as in Chin and Meredith. Um, and then finally, also as in the data, it seems that it's not just the uh, level of the interest rate differential that matters for UIP, but also uh, the, the slope differential across these two countries. But again, as maturity goes out uh, to longer and longer, as the holding period gets bigger, we get closer and closer to the predictions of a standard UIP type of model. Um, so I know that was a bit fast, but that's because I want to spend the last few minutes um, just discussing the policy experiments that we use this fully fledged numerical model to conduct. So we're gonna conduct a few policy experiments here. Um, we're gonna look at monetary policy shocks in both the US and the UK which we're gonna model as an unanticipated 25 basis point decrease in the policy rates. And then we're gonna contrast that with what the model implies for QE shocks, which are gonna be unanticipated positive demand shocks, again, in the US and the UK. Um, and to calibrate the size of these shocks and make them comparable, we're gonna calibrate the size such that the yield responds on average roughly the same in a given country uh, as a given country's monetary policy shocks. And we can use this full, fully fledged version of the model to uh, assess the movements in exchange rates and how spillovers uh, for these policies go across the domestic yield curves and the international spillovers to the foreign yield curves. So first up, I have the model implied responses to the home monetary policy shock uh, in the top row and the foreign monetary policy shock in the bottom row. This top left panel is the on impact response of the yield curves in the home and the foreign to the US monetary policy shock. And the top right here, is the exchange rate response uh, to the monetary policy shock. And the analogous uh, figures are here plotted below for the foreign monetary policy shock. And so there's some interesting, I think, asymmetries here, but broadly speaking, I think the takeaways is that the responses amongst, across yield curves are largely contained to within the country. There's not that big of responses uh, across countries in the yield curves. And instead, the spillovers are really confined to the exchange rates. Um, the story is quite different when we look at the QE shock, particularly the U.S. large-scale asset purchases. So if we look at this top panel, we see that uh, the foreign yield curve responds essentially the same as the, as the home, as the home uh, yield curve, almost one for one and sometimes even a little more uh, for intermediate uh, maturities. Um, and also, if you compare the uh, QE shock and the monetary policy shock's effect on the exchange rate, see that the exchange rate actually moves almost double 
uh, a little bit more than double actually uh, what's implied by the monetary policy shock. And just in terms of magnitude. Walker, so, could I uh, ask yeah. a question here? So what's the yeah. intuition for why, when you're looking at these QE shocks, why the foreign yield curve is so much more sensitive? Why the exchange rate doesn't do more of the work in adjusting? Yeah, so it's um, both what I was talking about earlier, this, this idea that, you know, so uh, the, when you go and you buy um, long-term bonds in a given country, that essentially opens up these arbitrages to now they, you know, they require like anything that has similar risk characteristics they're now willing to invest in. Um, and so that also then puts strong downward pressure on foreign yields as well. But the, but the reason here um, that there's this kind of strong asymmetric effect when we look at the US versus the UK is because the data really seems to favor this correlation structure between the demand factors and, and monetary policy in the different countries. Um, and so then, and if you look at, and again, so the, the so like I said, this, these QE shocks are calibrated to be comparable um, to the size of the monetary policy shock. But so what that really means is that these aren't particularly big QE shocks. Basically, you're moving the 10-year yield by a little over five basis points. Uh, but if you scale this up to say, you know, the type of QE shocks that we've seen, say QE1 back in 2009, that would have implied roughly a three to 4% depreciation of the dollar, which is actually very close to what we've found, what has been found in the high frequency analysis for how the exchange rate has moved. And real um, quickly, I think this is a good question that'll help the audience understand. Matteo is wondering why there's an asymmetry in these two pictures on the left. Yeah, so the asymmetry is because of the, because the model finds, so, it has a lot to do with the, the asymmetry that is found both in terms of uh, what the data favors in terms of how uh, big the elasticities and the size of these typical demand shocks are. So in other words, like uh, de uh, demand, risky demand shocks in the home uh, in the US are a bit much bigger source of risk that arbitrators need to hedge against relative to, to foreign shocks. And because of these correlation structure uh, across demand factors along with the home, home rates as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so and that's, that's all that I wanted to really talk about today. Um, so just to wrap up, I think I have almost, actually, this is amazing. This is the first online seminar I've done where I actually uh, even came close to doing things on time. So just to wrap up, we've presented this integrated framework to study the joint determinants of bond term premia and currency risk premia by extending the preferred habitat model of Ionos and Vila to a two-country environment. Um, and the model both does a good job of matching kind of the observed facts regarding the joint determinants of these risk, both of these risk premia, and from an open economy macro perspective, I think one of the important policy takeaways here is, at least through the lens of our model, um, international spillovers of, of monetary policy are quite important. Um, so despite the fact that capital is flowing freely, despite the fact that exchange rates are floating freely, we still are gonna, it's still gonna be the case that policy shocks abroad have strong effects on yield curves domestically. Um, and so with that, let me, I guess I'll pause and open it up to the Q&A. Okay, great. So at this point, I wanna encourage uh, the audience to submit their questions in the chat if they have any, and I wanna um, give Javier uh, a chance uh, to maybe ask his question um, about the uh, trilemma again and see if we can shed some more light on that. Javier? Hi. Um... I'm trying to see if I can start my video, but anyway. Uh, so now it, it's very interesting presentation. I think these are uh, fascinating issues. Uh, so I wanted to follow up on the question I asked during the talk, which is on the failure of the of the trilemma. Uh, and so your answer was basically that yes, okay, the, the government can set the short term rate, but I still don't get why the government is not able to set the entire yield curve, the nominal yield curve. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's one question. Uh, and then another question, I want to follow up on, on, on Alex's question, which is about the demand functions that you have. So if you think about a, a real demand for bonds, then the nominal demand should be proportional to the exchange rate. So I was wondering how, how this is consistent with the formulation of the demand you have and, and whether this matters or not. I, I understand you have a, 
of a nominal model, but if you were to think about uh, real demands, uh, I think you will get this uh, this result. The nominal demands would be proportional, and and I don't know how this would how this would matter. Okay. Um, so again, so go, coming back to the trilemma issue, so I think what you're saying is that this, so we agree that there is spillovers from foreign uh, fluctuations in foreign monetary policy to the yield curve, say in the U.S. Um, but what you're saying is that potentially this, the Fed can adjust its interest rate rule in order to um, in order to target the entire yield curve. And Correct. Yeah. So I would I agree with that in the case of um, the, a simplified, a simple version of the model, like I was t discussing earlier, where there's essentially like one, two risk factors, and one of them is in fact the, the Fed's short policy rate. Um, as you would add additional and additional risk factors, while the Fed still only has control of one policy tool or maybe two with QE, that becomes more and more difficult and potentially impossible to do, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, I, uh, I can't, you know. Uh, I, I'll take a look at the at the paper, but uh, you, I mean, you know, if you can, so, yeah. I, so I agree with I, I agree with the point you're making that um, the the so really it's like in some sense part of this failure is if the Fed just continues to follow like a simple Taylor rule or something, um, but there's nothing stopping him from following a more complicated rule. Yeah, um, yeah. But on the other hand, as the shocks that are in the economy become more and more complicated, it may be the case that. Um, it is the case that only one or two policy uh, tools are not going to be enough to fully uh, isolate the yield curve from those shocks. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, Javier. Thanks for uh, uh, your question. I want to um, turn to uh, Oleg now. Oleg, I think you're a panelist now, so you should be able to unmute yourself and, and uh, ask, ask your question to uh, Walker. Okay. So just uh, to quickly clarify what I was thinking, it just seems that exchange rate and uh, the price on the bond market, they're not exact counterparts in the sense that for the log P in the bonds market, there is an actual benchmark of either a zero or a log beta, the discount rate, so that when log P moves, you kind of move in the interest rate in the bonds market, which is comparable in units to delta exchange rate. Like if you think of the UIP returns, we compare the interest rate, which is kind of like the log P units to the delta E, and there is a good reason for that because Normal exchange rate is just a choice of units, right? When you do financial trade. So by itself, a three day is not meaningful, right? Whether normal exchange rate is 10 or one, it really, you know, in a law, it really just wouldn't would matter. And so I was thinking, I understand your answer that it becomes tractable. And so if you did delta E instead of E, you would get a high order differential equation. But uh, like the sense that I'm not getting is that qualitative patterns, when you solve that high order differential equation would be the same. And in particular, as the endogenous process for exchange uh, changes, right? I mean, the process for E and delta E are not necessarily changing in the same way. So I was kind of curious, how much do you lose by not doing it? But it's more of a sort of like a technical question, right? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I, we haven't thought a ton about trying to specify the habitat demands in terms of delta E versus E, um, but maybe we could try it. I mean, it's uh, without having tried it, I don't know. It's, it's possible that it still would potentially deliver trackable results. On the other hand, uh, let me just say though, in terms of like the units issue, um, so what we end up with is, you know, these, these are fine, all the prices end up being a fine uh, function of the state variable. And so some of the, I think some of the concern you have about units gets all absorbed into the constant terms, um, which play no role uh, in any of the analysis that I talked about. Um, uh, but the, the point is still taken about, uh, about specifying these, this demand uh, FX demand in terms of the level of the exchange rate is certainly non-standard, um, but it's the approach we took at least to, as a benchmark. No, just a quick addition here. I understand that the constant will exactly do with it if exchange rate was reversing, and then you kind of have movements relative to a constant. And that could be the argument that if, if it delivers a stationary nominal or real exchange rate that may be specifying in level terms, is 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 just fine to agree. I had a quick additional question, uh, which is. And this is probably the ignorance of the model and I plan to read it carefully and then probably I'll have the answer to myself, but given that I haven't yet, here's my question. With, is the model flexible enough to uh, rationalize any pattern of co-movement and carry trade returns 
and um, the uh, deterrence at different parts of the term structure. So like on, you know, like, you know, three year bonds versus five year bonds versus 10 year bonds. Like if you could point out in the model, which parameters would like flexibly allow you to match any patterns that would just help me with like mechanics of the model a little more. Yeah, fair enough. So in the full, in, so some of the more complicated correlation structures you're talking about, we can only do with the, the fully fledged numerical version of the model. Um, and then the mapping from parameters to the data can be a little complicated. Um, we're in the process. I mean, this, this is somewhat of a preliminary numerical exercise. So we're in the process, I think, of um, you know, more tightly tying down the data that we target to the parameters. Of course, it's all done jointly. Um, so it can be kind of the interpretation sometimes can be tricky relative to just uh, what, the, what the algorithm is actually doing. Um, I just a quick clarification here. So I think it would be super useful to say what has to be true in this model independently of parameterization and what is the result of estimation kind of fitting the data in the sense that uh, yes. it's something uniquely flexible about the model versus it's more a decomposition exercise inside the model that the model can fit any pattern. But if the pattern and the data is like this, the parameters have to be that way. Right? Sure. Yeah, that's so to, towards that a little bit. Most basically the stuff, a lot of the stuff that I talked about in the first uh, half of the talk, uh, those analytical results are going to be, those mechanisms are going to be there kind of regardless of uh, the parameterization. Um, the stuff I talked about at the end definitely is going to be a function of the, of the parameters. Of course, I mean, we calibrated the model to match some of those parameters. But that's, that's, a, that's a good, uh, useful, I think, framing device. Okay, great. And then um, we have a few remaining minutes. So I want to give the floor to Matteo, who had a follow-up question for you. So uh, this is a very exciting paper, and I really like it. I have a question and a suggestion. The, the question has to do with um, following up on these issues of what the demand depends on. Uh, for QE, um, have you tried to feed uh, a news shock, like an announcement? Not the actual QE purchases, but just knowing that in the future there will be these purchases and they're being announced today. Because that might sort of sharpen the intuition of whether the demand, you know, whether the fact that the demand depends only on the current exchange rate versus the future one. Um, might be meaningful from an economics perspective. That's just one of the typical things I would do uh, okay. as an example to figure it out. Um, yes, we, ha we, we haven't done that. So. In, in practice, it seems that in the data, the announcement effects, particularly on exchange rates, uh, seem to have been big anecdotally. Um, right. So you could, you could take a look at that. And then the suggestion is to do more with the calibration. I mean, that's the part that I was, um, I was asking in the chat before uh, on the asymmetry between the two, the two countries. I think it would be helpful uh, to understand the model and how you bring it to the data to do a calibration to two countries that are in some sense symmetric and then one with the US. The reason is that there are many, you know, the US is a funny one to pick. Uh, as an example, it's the exception and not the rule when it comes to financial markets. Uh, and so I'll, it's not easy for me to figure out what is due to the dollar being so central, the US monetary policy shocks being so important, and what is the model doing? And so I would do a calibration to two small open economies and then one with the US. Uh, even if you don't have three models in the country, you can do two separate calibrations. I think it will really help uh, bring out what is, what is the model deriving from the parameterization versus the core environment. Thanks. Yeah, I think that, that's, a, that's a great suggestion. Um, of course, the, you know, we choose the US because so much of the questions we're interested in involve the specialness of the US. But I guess you're, it's a great point that uh, in terms of understanding what you gain as you move from more and more complicated versions of the model, that could probably help clarify things a lot. So thank you. OK, great. Well, uh, um, I think we're just about out of time. So I want to thank Walker for an excellent presentation. And I want to remind everyone that two weeks from now, we'll have a, another OIFM uh, seminar lined up, the dollar and the global price of risk is going to be presented by Ron uh, Kekri from Chicago Booth. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone, um, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Walker.